Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. It's so good to see everybody for part three of our wonderful series on, on um, contemporary Jewish issues from the Sephardic perspective. For those who don't know me, my name is Ethan Marcus. I am the managing director of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, the national umbrella organization for the Latino speaking Sephardic community in the United States. And we're very happy and excited to partner with the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals to bring you this wonderful four part series with Rabbi Dr. Mark Angel. Just as a reminder, this is through our partnership initiative, the Sephardic Digital Academy, a national program partnering with all different communities around the country and really around the world to bring you wonderful digital programs on Sephardic history, Torah, Halakha, um, Latino language and culture, and Sephardic cooking, delicious Sephardic cooking. Um, if you haven't checked out our website, please do to look up all our other classes at SephardicBrotherhood.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy. Without further ado, we have our guest of honor, our educator tonight, Rabbi Mark Angel. Rabbi, whenever you're ready, say chavon. Okay. okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Ethan. We're about to celebrate the holiday of Shavuot, which commemorates the great revelation at Mount Sinai. All of us were there, we remember? And if we weren't there, we only saw the movie. So, so uh, hopefully we have it in mind very well what it was to have the revelation. It was a one time in human history where Almighty God revealed himself to the entire nation. Hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children heard the voice of God, received the great commandments. Now, I'm only an angel, I'm not God, but I'm trying to figure out what did God have in mind at that sacred moment? He chose of all the people of the world, a group of slaves who had been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years, a small tribe of people, not big on the world scene. He chose this group of people, the Israelites, to receive this amazing message. And what did God have in mind? Well, let me see what he didn't have in mind. I don't think he had in mind that the Jewish people, the people of Israel, should take the Torah and put it into a little room and have no impact on the world. There's a wonderful midrash that says when God gave the Torah at Sinai, his voice came in 70 languages. It's a strange midrash because the Israelites certainly didn't know 70 languages. But the rabbis are telling us that the Torah is universal. It has a message for all of humanity. In those days, they thought there were 70 nations of the world. So God gave the Torah in the language of all the nations of the world. And the people of Israel were supposed to take this message and spread it out to all the 70 nations. The Torah was understandable and had a message to everybody. So if God gave us the Torah in such a tremendous scene, it stands to reason that he wanted us to take that message and convey it to the world. And we might say, we did a great job through the Bible. Through the Bible of the Jewish people, we've impacted on billions of people. The Christian faith is based on our Bible. Islam is very much uh, rooted in the Bible. We've impacted on the morality, not only of Western civilization, but of civilization of all humanity. So we did a good job by and large. So there's a universal message that we had, but how did we package that universal message? So if you look at the Torah, there are many laws, which are very specific, ritual laws that apply only to us and to nobody else. So it means that God had in mind that not only do we have this universal message to share with humanity, but we have a particular way of life that God chose for us. And somehow or other by maintaining that way of life, we're able better not only to fulfill ourselves as individual human beings, but we're also able to convey our message. If we would simply give up our individual practices, our particularism, we would eventually disintegrate as a people and there would be no message to give. Now, in modern times, we have to think about Judaism. Are we a universal people or are we a particularistic people? What do we emphasize? Well, there are two answers. One answer is there's a great stress on narrowness. So all of us unfortunately saw the disaster recently at Meron in Israel where 100,000 people gathered, mostly Hasidim, Haredim, and the great tragedy befell the people. 45 people were killed, etc. You all know the story. But for those kind of Jews, and there are hundreds of thousands of them, maybe 
a million of them in the world, they have one idea of what Torah is. Torah is a closed book. Torah belongs in a closed society. They don't care about a message to the universe, a message to humanity. That's not their concern. Their concern is having kids, having yeshivas, having a way of life which is specific, local, private, particular, and the rest of the world can take care of itself. For them, Judaism, the revelation at Sinai was perfectly fulfilled. If you had Jewish enclaves in B'nai Barak or in Borough Park or wherever it'll be, completely separate from the rest of the world. That's one vision. Seems to me an incorrect vision. It didn't seem to me logical that what God would go to all the trouble to give a Torah at Mount Sinai and say, I only want a few people in a few locations to dress funny, act funny, and be separate from all of humanity. Doesn't seem to be the message. On the other side, some people say, well, the message is universal message, ethics, humanitarianism, business ethics, caring for each other. God created all, uh, all human beings in the image of God. And those are absolutely true things and wonderful things. But if all we have is the universal aspect of Judaism, eventually that becomes watered down also. If we don't maintain the ritual part also, the cohesiveness of ourselves as a community disintegrates. And we have a universal message that anyone could have. And the specific Jewish component of that gets lost in the process. So there's a great thinker in the 19th, in the 19th century, Rabbi Eliyahu ben Amozeg. He was of Moroccan background. He was a rabbi in Livorno in Italy. And he wrote many things. One of the books that he wrote was called Israel and Humanity. And in this book, he points out the universal teachings of Judaism. In fact, he presented Judaism as the most universal religion. Other religions say, unless you believe our way, you have no place in the world to come. God only loves us. The Jewish people, on the other hand, say God loves all people. And not only that, we have a distinctive teaching in the Talmud that all righteous people of all nations of the world have a place in the world to come. It's not reserved only for Jews. It's reserved for all good people everywhere. So Rabbi Ben Amozeg argued this universal vision that Judaism has something to teach all of the world and something very powerful that the whole world needs. On the other side, said Rabbi Ben Amozeg, it's important for we as, as the Jewish people to maintain our own specific traditions and rituals and way of life so that we can continue to be the spokespeople for this, these ideals. Because once we give up our particularistic message, our universal message is also a compromise or lost. Okay, those are two things. What about us now? We don't wanna to go to one extreme or we don't wanna to go to the other extreme. We wanna be, let's call ourselves, good, normal, healthy Jews. We wanna be good people who value the universal teachings of Judaism, who see Judaism as a world religion. At the same time, we wanna have commitment to our own particularistic observances, traditions, where we feel at home. We wanna feel spiritually at home. When we go to synagogue and we hear the melodies, when we observe the Pesach, when we observe Shavuot, when we observe Sukkot, these things enrich us, they, they strengthen us, they make us feel who we are, they give us our identities. Now over the many centuries, going back a couple thousand years, the Jewish people lived in many different lands. And by and large, this is a very big generalization that historians make, we eventually divided into two different groups, an Ashkenazic Jewish group and a Sephardic Jewish group. It's, those are very general terms. There are many more people than that. Uh, they're not just two groups of us, there are lots of groups of us. But just for the convenience sake, there are people who more or less follow the Ashkenazic traditions and others more or less follow the Sephardic traditions. But each group developed its own quotation marks ethnicities. In other words, a Jew growing up in Poland or in Hungary or in Germany would have one set of foods, one set of melodies to their synagogue services, one set of rituals, customs, etc. And a Jew growing up in Marrakesh or Istanbul or Yanina or Baghdad, they would each have their own distinctive way of doing things and would find meaning in their own particular ethnicities. Now over the centuries, by and large, these ethnicities existed in isolation. Eastern European Jews were Eastern European. The Jews in North Africa were the Jews of North Africa. They had very little inter interconnection. The Jews of Turkey who spoke Ladino and the Jews in Syria who spoke Syri uh, Arabic, 
they knew of each other, but they couldn't talk to each other. They had different ethnicities. And so it was. So each one of us has, whatever background we come from, has a, an ethnic component to who we are. The ethnic component doesn't take away our universalism. It, the uh, ethnic part of us is part of us, but not all of us. The ethnic part is the part that makes us feel comfortable at home spiritually to know who we are. But once we have those ingredients, the idea is to take those feelings, take the strength of our personalities and convey that to a larger audience, to the world at large, to society at large. Now, let's, I wanna talk personally and then we'll talk more generally, personally, okay. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, among Jews. My grandparents came from, my mother's parents came from Turkey. My grandparents on my father's side came from the island of Rhodes. They spoke Ladino, Judeo-Spanish. I grew up in that community and my parents were both born in Seattle. So we're all time Seattle family. For me, when I hear the old melodies, the old Ladino songs, when I eat the uh, beautiful Sephardic foods, it's very emotional to me, very, very meaningful to me. It helps define who I am. Without those things, I would be less of a person. So those traditions are kind of the salt and pepper, the spices who make me who I am. But my brain is not confined to those traditions. My brain, my real personality, is also composed of other things. I'm also American. I learned from American traditions. I'm also a student of literature. I read, read literature from many countries, from many authors, men and women, many different religions. My ability to assimilate all that knowledge takes me from my particular position into a more universal position. I mean, I don't only function within my local milieu. I don't live within four cubits of Sephardic life. I live within a drawing on those four cubits of Sephardic life, but I apply that to the universe at large. That's me. That's probably all of us who are listening in today. But I want to ask a profound question. I don't have an immediate answer for you. So you'll have to help me answer it. Yes, I, I'm really Sephardic. My parents are both Sephardic. My grandparents, all four of them were Sephardic. I've written books and books and articles and articles about Sephardic things. I was a rabbi of Sephardic synagogue since 1969. You, anything about me is Sephardic. I'm famous for that. You can't miss that Rabbi Mark Angel. Oh, he's a classic Sephardic Jew. It's true, I'm, I'm a good classic Sephardic Jew. Good. But what will, what will my great, great grandchildren be? Who will our children be, our grandchildren, a hundred years from now? How important will it be to them that they have Sephardic ancestry? What will it mean to them? So for me, when I hear a Ladino song, I hear my grandmother's voice or my mother's voice. So it's very emotional. But my great, great, great grandchildren, they're not gonna hear those voices, right? If I eat some wonderful food that my wife makes for me, so it reminds me of the food that my mother cooked, or my grandmother cooked, oh, so it has an extra meaning to me. But my great, great, great grandchildren what will it mean to them? What will, they, what will they care? They won't have that emotional attachment. So what I'm trying to say is this. There's a difference between being an ethnic Sephardic Jew and between Sephardism. I'll call it Sephardim past, uh, past, past ethnicity. Jews who themselves were either born in the old country or whose parents and grandparents were deeply saturated by the old country, we can still call ourselves in some respect ethnic. Even though we're very different from our grandparents, still we still fit within the general context of who they were. But ethnicity is something that evolves. It's not one thing. Sometimes people say, I wanna preserve the Sephardic heritage. My answer is, you don't preserve a heritage. You preserve fish, you preserve fruit. You don't preserve a heritage. A heritage, if it's alive, grows, it changes. Nothing stays stagnant. If it stays stagnant, it means it's dead. So now we're concerned a hundred years from now, what will people think? What will our, our own children and grandchildren, great, great, great grandchildren, what will be, will it be important at all that there was such a thing as a Sephardic Jew? Will our ethnicity mean anything at all to them at all? Well, I don't have a complete answer, but I have some tentative answers. First of all, 
I would suggest that in 100 years from now, there'll be very, very few purely ethnic Sephardic Jews in the world, as there'll be very few purely ethnic Ashkenazic Jews in the world. Why? We marry each other. Society has changed. For hundreds and hundreds of years, Sephardim lived in their world, Ashkenazim lived in their world. But that's not, any, that's not the case anymore. In Israel, Sephardim and Ashkenazim, everybody lived together. Hundreds of nations, people from hundreds of nations came together in Israel. They all speak Hebrew. Their children, even if the old timers are still attached to their old countries, their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are Israelis. They have already have integrated with each other and are marrying each other in big numbers. Same thing in the United States. In the first generation, Sephardim generally married Sephardim. By this generation, and certainly by two generations from now, it'll be a greater rarity. In some communities, yes, they still are clinging to the old Maoris and they marry within the group, but by and large that's changing. By and large that can't hold. Maybe it'll hold another one generation, maybe two generations, but not 10 generations. It can't, it can't hold. Why? Because our kids are going to the same schools. Sephardim and Ashkenazim meet each other, they love each other, and that's it. Our problem isn't just that Sephardim and Ashkenazim meet, we also meet non-Jews, and Jew, our, some of our children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, are also prone to marry out of the faith, which is a problem or an issue that we're currently facing as well. Having said that, let's go back to my original question. Judaism has a universal message. All these particular ethnicities within Judaism have their own particular fragrances and flavors and tastes and customs. But ultimately, if they lose vision for the universal message, they become a sect. They become confined. Judaism shouldn't be confined. If we have a message, and if we're living as vital human beings, we want to convey what we have with the world at large. We want the world to be, not just our community to be good, we want society as a whole to be good. So what are the things within Sephardic tradition that I think anyway, are extremely important and that I think I would like my great, 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 great grandchildren to draw on. I think, by the way, that a hundred years from now, all Jews should draw on all the traditions of the Jewish people. It shouldn't be ethnic anymore. It should be a universal Judaism, so to speak. We should draw on Yiddish literature and Ladino literature, on Judeo-Italian literature, on the literature of the Jews of Iraq, the Jews of North Africa. All of these things are part of the jigsaw puzzle of the Jewish people. And each community, each ethnicity, so to speak, has a contribution to make. And we are all richer and better by drawing on all of those things. It's not good, I don't think, just to rely on our own wisdom, our own traditions, and not to be open, receptive to other things. On the contrary, the more open we are to the best in different Jewish ethnicities, the better, the stronger we are as human beings and as Jews. And let me just go back to one other point. Jews are Jews. Yes, very, very proud to say so. But we're also human beings, strange as it might seem. Human beings have a role to play in the world at large. All of science, all of literature, all of history, all of aesthetics, it belongs to Jews just like to all other human beings. And if we lose that capacity to connect as human beings to the world, it limits us. As I said before, it turns us into a sect. And I don't think God at Mount Sinai thought we should just be a sect. I thought God wanted us to be a universal religion, a religion that has a message for humanity at large. So let me talk about a few things that I think are very relevant to Sephardic tradition that I think will help make us better Jews and better human beings. And let me make one other preface. If a, in a hundred years from now, I have to choose that my children should either be good Sephardic Jews or good Jews, I say without embarrassment, I want them to be good Jews. I want the Sephardic to be a component of their lives, but most important is they should be good Jews. They should learn Torah, they should be devoted to the Torah, and they should live with a vision of Judaism as a universal religion. Now let's go to some of the specific things within the Sephardic tradition that I think make us better people. And because what makes us better people, it makes us better human beings. One thing that I think is common to the Sephardic world is what I call inwardness or interiority. What does that mean? 
means self-respect. It means thinking inwardly, not measuring ourselves by what other people think of us, but by having the confidence to be who we are. I think back always to my beloved grandparents, Marco and Sultana Romi, who came from Turkey in the early part of the 20th century. They got married in Seattle. And they were not formally educated. My grandmother, I don't think she could read or write. My grandfather became an American citizen. He was a barber. They were what you call plain ordinary people. But they knew who they were. They walked with great confidence, with great poise. I remember as a little boy, when I was in the Hebrew day school in Seattle, the teacher asked us to uh, find out what tribe we're from. He meant, are we a Kohen or a Levi or Israel? So I came home and asked my mother, what tribe are we from? I don't know, call it Papu. We called my grandfather Papu. Papu, what tribe are we from? And Papu said, we're from the tribe of Yehuda. Okay. Next day I go to school, the teacher says, who are you from? Kohen, you, Levi, angel, Yehuda. Says, Yehuda, that's not one of the choices. You're either Kohen or you're Levi or Israel. Yehuda is not a choice. I said, well, I asked my grandfather. My grandfather said, we're from the tribe of Yehuda. Oh, your grandfather's an ignorant man. Oh, he felt terrible. I started to cry. Horrible. I came home. I told my mother. She says, call a Papu. I called Papu. Papu, I went to school, and I told the teacher I was from the tribe of Yehuda, and he didn't believe me. So my grandfather said, your teacher is an ignorant man. We are from the tribe of Yehuda. It says in the Bible that the aristocracy of Judea were brought to Spain, and that's us. We're the aristocrats. And my grandfather, who could barely read and write, who was never very affluent financially, who was a barber, in his mind, he was aristocracy of the Jewish people. He was an aristocrat, temporarily reduced, but he was an aristocrat. When he carried himself, he carried himself as a prince. He knew who he was. He didn't have questions. He didn't have identity crisis. I look back at them, my grandparents, and many of people of that generation, they were people who had inner strength, inner confidence. They didn't measure themselves against other people. They measured themselves against themselves and what they could be in the eyes of God. Honesty, justice, fairness to who they were. Hardworking, dedicated people. There's a wonderful story told in Midrash that was drawn by the Mayam Loez, which is a great Ladino com biblical commentary about the Ten Commandments. The first set of Ten Commandments, Moses goes to the top of the mountain and there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people there, the sound of shofar, sound of the lightning is shining, tremendous event, a media event, they made a movie out of it, tremendous. What happened to those 10 commandments? Well, Moshe came down from the mountain, he saw the people worshiping the golden calf and he took the tablets, he threw them down, boom, the end, shattered them. So then Moshe had to go a second time. And this time God said, Moshe, this time you carve out the tablets yourself. There's not going to be any fanfare, no shofar, no lightning, no thunder, nothing. You get up there for 40 days and 40 nights and do your job. And what happened to those Ten Commandments? Moses brought them down from the mountain. They were put in the ark. They became the foundation of the Jewish people. Says the Mayam Loez, what's important in life? What's really important in life? Not all the fanfare, not all the commotion, not all the noise, not all the PR. What's important? What would you do in the mountain all by yourself, by the sweat of your own brow? That's important. That's going to last. That's a message. That was a message that was conveyed by the intellectuals and by the folk of the Sephardic spirit. A sense of, let me do my work. Let me do it honestly and faithfully. That's what's important. Other people are going to root for me or, or praise me. That's not the point. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for my own integrity. And that's what I call interiority. In the 16th century, we had the famous um, expression of Kabbalah in the 16th century Sfat. And they, one of the concepts that came out of that was attributed to Rabbi Yisak Luria. It was called Tikkun. Tikkun means basically that we have a job. The job is to repair the world. When God created the world, things didn't work out the way he had planned. There were divine sparks that were shattered and scattered here and there in the next place. And us, by doing mitzvot, by doing acts of righteousness, we, in a sense, redeem the world. We're, part, we're partners in the world. That's an important thing, to know that what we do counts. Let me give another example. Rabbi 
the Or HaChayim, the Chayim Ben Atar, is a Moroccan rabbi also in the 1700s. He was a Kabbalist. He wrote a wonderful commentary in the Torah called Or HaChayim. And he raised the following question. God created the world in six days, or we'll call them six cycles, six days. What did God do on the seventh day? He rested. What happened on the eighth day? Well, good question. So according to the Kabbalah, the world was only supposed to exist for seven days, and then God was going to destroy it and do something else. God didn't need the world to go on. But God experienced Shabbat, so to speak. There's all poetic language. Shabbat vayinafash. Oh, God said, oh, he took a deep breath, so to speak. Ah, he likes Shabbat so much. I'm going to make the world go on another six days so I can have another Shabbat. And then I'll destroy the world. And God kept on doing that. Finally, with the people of Israel, God gave, said to the people of Israel, you're our partner. You're my partner. You keep Shabbat. As long as the people of Israel keep Shabbat, the world will exist. But if there would ever be one Shabbat, when every Jew in the world violates Shabbat, there, there will be no Sunday. That will be the end of the world. And on the other side, if all the Jews of the world would keep Shabbat, you know what's going to happen? Mashiach is going to come. Who are the ones who control the world? <laughs> Strangely enough, Jews, by our actions. Now, let's think about that. Here's a little poor little Jew, struggles all week long, hardly can make a living. He comes home on Friday night. He has a family, his wife, he has six kids. They're half starved. And he takes a wine and he says, Kiddush. To the outsider looking at that man and to the family, they're saying, these are losers. These people are poor and they're nothing. But what's going on in that person's mind? I'm partner with the God. By my sanctifying Shabbat, there's going to be a Sunday. By my participation in the Sabbath, I am prolonging the world. Now, this is all poetic, it's all philosophical, okay. But it also seeps into the soul. It means my actions are not random. My actions are not without meaning. When I do a mitzvah, it's not just to do something by ritual, just because my grandfather did it. No. It's making me partner with God in the creation of the world or maintenance of the world. But these are very powerful concepts. And they're concepts that make us feel who we are. They make us stand tall. Not to feel that we're to let other people judge who we are. And not to judge ourselves by the other standards that other people set for us. But to know who we are. That's a great value. And that value pervades the Sephardic tradition, both on the intellectual level and on the folk level. That's what I want my great, 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 great grandchildren to know, that their Sephardic ancestors taught them to be people, taught them to have integrity, taught them to stand up, taught them not to judge themselves by what other people say, but to be true to themselves. That's what I want them to learn from our tradition. Let me tell them something else. When I grew up, I had the, mis the mistaken notion, it wasn't really a mistake, I had a mistaken notion that being Jewish was about the most fun thing you could be. Everything was a party. We didn't have Shabbat lunch. Shabbat was a Shabbat party. My mother cooked a ton of stuff. And not, not only were our family there, but visitors would come in. People would come for Kiddush, visitors, aunts, calls, aunts, cousins, all day long, in and out of the house. And then we would go to other people's houses. It was every single Shabbat was like a party. It was like a festival. And every festival, of course, was a festival. We got together, we sang, we ate, we had a wonderful time. Whether that was important or not important, we always had a, what I call, fun. Uh, I remember vividly my uh, parents, my grandparents, my uncles and aunts dancing. They liked to dance the Turkish music. My uncle Jack used to bring us tambourine and they used to bat the tambourine and everyone would have Turkish records on and they would be doing the Turkish dancing. Life was fun. Judaism wasn't oppressive. Judaism wasn't something that you had to do, otherwise you'd get punished. Judaism was something that really fulfilled your life. It opened you. It didn't limit you. It opened you. It gave you more opportunities. We had so much fun. We couldn't believe why other people didn't have so much fun as we did. I make a joke. I probably said it to you before, that I, don't, I didn't meet my first neurotic Jew until I came to New York. Growing up in Seattle, we didn't, in at least my generation, um, people were more ancho. We laid back, more laid back. Manana, don't worry, God will take care of it. We'll have, we'll, we'll have a good time, we'll enjoy our lives. And if people have more money than us or less money than us, we're not in competition. So I call this thing, uh, this thing uh, quality, an optimism about life. Life generally is good. 
Um, I give an example a number of times, but I'll repeat it to you because in case some of you didn't hear it. Uh, when I came to Yeshiva in New York as a, in a freshman in 1963, so one of my friends invited me to his house for a Shabbat. And it was a Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh. And there are beautiful chazan, or I should say a chazan, who sang the service. And this chazan sang a special prayer for Rosh Chodesh. And he's singing with a beautiful voice, an operatic voice, and he's praying to God. Chayim shel shalom, chayim shel tovo, chayim shel brocho, chayim shel parnoso. What is he asking for? God, give us a good life, good health, good prosperity. He's asking for all these good things, and he's crying his guts out. Okay. Now, in the old country of Seattle, and it's true of many, most I think almost for all Sephardic synagogues, on Kippur, we come before God, and we say, God, we have sinned before you. Have compassion on us. Have mercy on us. What could be more somber than that? How did we sing it? It was a hootenanny. Everyone sang at the top of their lungs. The synagogue rocked. What? We're coming before God saying we've done all these sins and we're singing like we're having a wonderful time. It's a party. Someone from the outside who heard us, they wouldn't know what we're saying. Yeah, there's a philosophy to that. The Ashkenazim, by and large, is also a generalization. They lived in very oppressive situations, they lived in cold countries, a lot of anti Semitism, they lived in ghettos, a lot of, they, and they cried. They had reason to cry. A lot of sad things uh, that they had to face. And when they came before God, they came with broken hearts. God, please give us parnasa. We're suffering here. God, give us health. We're suffering here. We need your help. The Sephardim, we also had our share of problems, but we had an optimistic view on life. God doesn't hate us. God isn't an old man with a big stick waiting for us to do a sin so he could zap us. Yes, of course we've sinned, God, but we could sing to you. You know why we could sing to you? Because you're our parents. You love us. If a little child does something wrong and comes to the parent to apologize, the, the child knows ahead of time the parent's going to for, forgive them. So the child isn't afraid of the parent. And so it is our feeling with, towards God. God is a loving father, a loving mother, God, a loving being. He doesn't want us to see, to see us fail. He doesn't want us to see us hurt. He, he knows that we do sins, and he gives us a way out by apologizing, by doing teshuvah, by doing salichot. There was a in one of the diaries of a Hasidic Rebbe, he writes about a trip that he took from, the, he was traveling from Europe to the Holy Land to make a pilgrimage. And the boat stopped off in Rhodes and other places in Turkey before going to the land of Israel. And he writes in his diary, this was the month of, uh, of Elul before Rosh Hashanah. He says, here's something amazing. The Sephardim on this boat are so pious. They wake up very, very early in the morning, every morning, and they say Salichot prayers of repentance with great solemnity. But during the day, they're happy of heart. They're having a good time. They're, they rejoice. And for him, it, sounded, it seemed odd. They would think piety means very serious austerity. That wasn't our kind of piety. And I want to make one more broad generalization. Some will agree with me, some won't agree with me. But I think generally speaking in the Ottoman Empire and North Africa, the Middle East, the attitude of most Jews, not all Sephardi, but most communities, was to take Judaism in a natural way. Not, not, not to be extremely fanatical this way or not to be extremely fanatical that way, but Judaism is a natural way of living one's life. Uh, one of my books, I called it The Rhythms of Jewish Living, a Sephardic approach. There, there's a rhythm to life and a beauty to life. And music is part of life, and love is part of life, and aesthetics is part of life, and nature is part of life. And the Sephardim, even in various communities, even if they were fairly limited in different possibilities, they, had, they were open to those things. They didn't only cry, they also laughed. I think mostly laughed. Judging on my childhood, I can't judge everybody else's. But for me, being Sephardic was the best thing in the world. My, uh, my friends were always jealous that we always had parties and have good times. And, uh, and that was something very, very special. 
I want my great, great, great grandchildren to rejoice in their Judaism. I want them to celebrate Judaism. I want them to remember that their great, great, great back, Papa way back when loved Judaism and was happy with it and learned that way. And that that was part of a Jewish tradition, not an apologetic tradition, not a neurotic tradition, but a tradition that accepted life openly, beautifully, compassionately, sweetly, and with song. Okay, let me give one other thing. I call it gracefulness and good manners. You would think that people who are by and large on the lower economic rung of things, which most Sephardic immigrants were in those days, they would be you know, plain ordinary people. And in certain ways, of course, they were. I don't wanna overgeneralize. However, one thing that was very impressed, important to them was kavod, honor. When my grandfather would be called to the Torah, or anyone would be called to the Torah, everyone would say, Bechavod, Bechavod, it was an important thing. You're honored. So my grandfather, who was a simple barber and uh, probably slightly above the poverty level, but not by much, when he got called to the Torah, half the synagogue stood up for him. Why? Because all your younger relatives stand up. He had seven children, children in law, grandchildren, nephews, nieces. Was he a poor man? No. When he got called to the Torah, he was a prince. Look how many people stood up for him in his honor. And when we stood up for him, we are a part of a clan, we are part of a family, we knew who we are. Even in the naming ceremonies, going back, back to another tradition, I have a special love for my grandfather, Romy. I would have had anyway, but I'm named after him. We named after living people. I'm a second born son. I was named after my mother's father, Mordechai, Mordechai Romy. And I have two grandsons named Mordechai. I'm glad to say they should live and be well. But there's something very powerful about that. There's a connection, there's a connection we matter, we're part of a family, we're part of a clan. I'm not saying that that held forever. I'm not saying that this generation has the same feelings that we had then, but there's something very powerful in that, which I hope in to some level could survive the future generations also, where few people feel this kind of connectedness. But the women, especially in those days, didn't work out of the house, very few did, but very, mostly they worked at home and they worked hard. They cooked, they had families, they cooked for us, they cleaned the house, they were very, very wonderful people. We wouldn't be who we are without them. But they also had certain customs. So I'll tell you a custom that they had in Seattle. I don't know if they had it other places. It was called a vigita. What's a vigita? My mother would get on the phone and say, Ma, aunties, cousins, what? Well, on Tuesday afternoon at three o'clock, we're gonna have a vigita. Okay. What is a VG? I mean, we're going to get together. They didn't watch TV in those days. They didn't have movies. They didn't have Zooms. They, they, had, they had social parties of their own. So, okay, she's just calling her own sisters, her own mother, her, her friends. So 10, 15 women show up on Tuesday afternoon at three o'clock. Does my mother serve them store-bought food? God forbid. Does she serve them on paper plates? God forbid. She has fine plates. She cooks all week to make sure that everything's just fine. She bakes. Everything's special, everything wonderful. Do the ladies come dressed in jeans? No, no, they come in their Shabbat clothes. My mother's dressed to fit the uh, Shabbat. Beautiful. What's going on? It's the Tuesday afternoon. There's no event, nothing special. It's not Shabbat, not a holiday. How come everyone's so dressed up? Honor. Invite somebody to your house is an honor. It's an honor. You have to honor them by preparing for them. You don't just give them some store-bought cookie. You cook for them, you show that you love them, you respect them. And when they come to appreciate that you're just inviting, that they're being honored by being invited, they come dressed properly. They don't come in schleppy clothes, to use an Ashkenazic word. They dress nicely, they dress beautifully. Honor. So for the women it was honor more, and for the men it's kavod, but it's the same, the same concept. There's a sense of personal dignity, a sense of aesthetics, a sense of propriety. There was another custom that my mother told us about in the old days. She would have a party and people would come to the party and you want them to go home. Okay, it's already late, go home. You can't tell people, you know, the party's over, go home. So what did they do? They had a symbol. So There's a certain kind of cookie made out of almond paste, called them almendradas. As soon as the host has passed, passed you an almendrada, it meant it's time for you to go home. They used to call it pasaporto. As soon as you got this, this was passed around. I said, oh, I'm getting tired. It's time to go home. Thank you so much for your hospitality. It was a lovely party. Thank you so much. No one said it, go home. There was a propriety, a sense of dignity, a sense of aesthetics, a sense you're important to me. I don't want to insult you. 
but I want you out of the house, but I don't want to insult you. It's time to go home, but I don't want to tell you that. So I tell you in a gentle way. I give you a hint, and everybody knew the hint, and that's how it worked. Gracefulness and good manners. Sometimes people think, well, you know, good manners is artificial. It's just, uh, who cares about it? It's, you shouldn't put so much stress on these things. Maybe. On the other hand, good manners are a reflection not to impress anybody else, but out of your own self-respect. If I'm an important person, if I have dignity of my own, I want to show that dignity of my own. I want to, to have that kind of comfort level where I can be a host and do it properly and show honor to the other people. People have the greatest, you know, one of the most difficult things to do is, one of the most difficult things to do is to give a genuine compliment. Why? To compliment someone means, am I, am I taking something away from myself? If I, say someone, if I say something positive about another person, it kind of feels, I don't really mean it. It really can't be that good. There's always a little bit of grudge in, a, in the feeling of compliment, an honest compliment. But a person could give an honest, genuine compliment. They have to have a lot of self-confidence first. That doesn't take anything away from me, really. To be able to praise somebody else doesn't take anything away from you. But many people have a difficulty giving honest compliments. So the Sephardim, at least the ones that I grew up with, they could share love, confidence, uh, praises of others naturally with a full heart, not holding anything back. That's, that's really, I find it more and more rare uh, in this day and age where people can be just honest, honest themselves. And finally, I want to make one other last point, going back to what I said about Rabbi Eliyahu, Eliyahu ben Amozeg. Many Sephardim, most Sephardim I'd have to even say, for hundreds of years, when they were living in the Middle East and Turkey and the Greece, wherever they were living, except in Western Europe, but the most Jews and the Muslim lands, were living in more or less self-enclosed areas. Yes, in the 19th century, they were getting influenced by French culture, I'm not gonna go through all of the history of the thing, but by and large, they were closed societies and they were inward looking. It was hard to develop a feeling for society at large when the society at large didn't like you. When you're living in a hostile society or in a society where you didn't have equal rights, it was hard for the Jews to develop uh, worldliness, let's say, in, um, in those kinds of societies. Once they started tasting freedom, they were start, Jews started to reclaim the universal aspect of Judaism. It took a while. We needed to survive for centuries without that universal vision, really. And eventually it came back to us. We're living at a time of great transition. Our ethnicity today is not gonna be the ethnicity of 100 years from now. Forget it, it's not gonna be that way. Our goal, our responsibility is, in my humble opinion, to take the very, very best of our tradition, to find out those things which give us strength as human beings, both in our particularistic sense and in our universal sense, a vision of life, a vision of society, a vision of God, a broadness of view that can make us not just pious and good people individually, but great individuals, great people who have an impact not only on ourselves and our families, but on a bigger circle uh, around on the world at large. I'm gonna close with one comment which kind of negates something that I've been saying, but it's important to say anyway. Years and years and years ago, I went to Wounded Knee in the South Dakota, which was a site of a massacre of Indians, the Sioux Indians, a very emotional time. I spent a week on the Indian reservations. I'm not gonna go through the whole story why and how, but because of that visit to the Indian reservation and time that I spent there, some other Indians from other tribes got in touch with me, including a man who was a chieftain of the Winnebago tribe. Okay, he came to New York to see me. And he says, here's a man from, I think from Minnesota, some, somewhere in the Midwest, an Indian who lives on a reservation. He says, I wanna know what is the secret of Jewish survival? How do you manage to maintain your identity even though you're living as part of, in, in, within a culture which is vastly outnumbering you? How do you do it? So I, I said, I don't, I don't know the whole formula but I know one thing, 
if we're not faithful to who we are, nothing lasts. It can't last. The more we, we the, if we don't blend in at all with everybody else, we can't have an impact on anybody else. If we blend in too much, we lose ourselves. It's walking a fine line. And I told them the famous passage in the Gemara, which I quote very often, that the way of Judaism, the way of the Torah is a narrow path. On the right hand is fire and on the left hand is ice. If you go too far to the right, you burn up with zeal, religious fanaticism. If you go too far to the left, you become too skeptical. You walk right in the middle. Is it easy to do? It's not easy to do. It's very difficult to do. And if you want to think about how I'm going to get my generations 100 years from now to walk that same line, you have to pray a lot and pray for the best. Not easy. But we can start by setting our own example. So I believe in the Sephardic ethnicity for us, for our generations. But I believe in the long term, our concern has to be not with ethnicity, but what I call Sephardism. We have to take the best qualities, the best values, the best teachings, the best traditions that we have, that will be relevant to children and grandchildren way, way down the line who are not going to be ethnic Sephardic anymore. They're going to be a mixture of Sephardic, Ashkenazic, Iranian, Yemenite, Greek, all kinds of things. They're not going to only want to be a Turkish Jew or a Moroccan Jew. They're going to be every, or an Ashkenazic Jew. They're going to be able to encompass many, many traditions. If we all do that, let's hope we can all do that, uh, then the revelation at Mount Sinai that we're going to celebrate in just a few weeks, I think will become more meaningful to us and to our future generations. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Rabbi Angel. Um, if you have any questions for the rabbi, please enter them in the chat and we're trying to get to as many as we can. Um, first question that comes up, how do you, you mentioned um, the fact that taking a little bits of each culture and kind of making the best together for this universalism of Judaism is, is, the, is one of the greatest outcomes possible. How do you do that often when uh, we see today in the world when a majority, a super majority, aka the Ashkenazi community, kind of dominates the narrative to the point at which they kind of crowd out and shout out um, any minority community all the time? That's a very good question. Um, everyone should join my institute. Go to jewishideas.org. One of our things, we, 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 we foster an intellectually vibrant, compassionate, and inclusive Orthodox Judaism. One of our agenda items is to get Sephardic ideas, traditions, values incorporated into the general Jewish educational system. We have a, we have a network of over 150 teachers now on, on board. We publish a book, teachers guides, we are fighting back. We think it's important that the Sephardic voice be enunciated for the general Jewish community. But here's what I think we shouldn't happen. I think very often when we get the Sephardic community voice into the general public is to sing our songs and to eat our food. It's folk, we're exotic. No one knows, we also have brains, we think. We have traditions, we have values. That they tend to ignore. They'll like to have a song, there was a, a one of the grossest examples I could think of was a Jewish day school in the New York area, I won't say which. They have a Sephardic day. What's a Sephardic day? They get some Sephardic women to come and bake burakas and they take pictures of the Sephardic students and they put them on the wall. Thank you very much. So you can't get much more patronizing than that. It's disgusting. We have to be able to articulate not just this quaint custom and that quaint custom. We have to articulate we have something of value to you. You can't really be a good Jew without us, just as we can't be a good Jew without you. And we published, if you go to our website, jewishideas.org, you'll find many articles of uh, Sephardic teachers and Ashkenazi teachers intermixed. The goal is not to have a Sephardic school, Sephardic uh, ethnic thing. The goal is all Jews should be open to all traditions. We should learn from everybody. Us, ah, being a minority among the Jews, it's hard. People don't listen to us. Well. We have mouths, we have brains, we have to stand together and fight. And we are doing that. What is the role of language playing kind of this uh, universalism versus particularism? Particularly Ladino, uh, we've seen a big uh, increase in interest, particularly among our younger generation. Does that have relevance when we're becoming more of a universalistic Judaism? Ladino, look, to, to me, I love it. I, I love listening to Ladino. I, my parents and grandparents spoke it. I speak it very poorly, but I read it nicely. I've written articles and books on, based on it. My grandchildren, great-grandchildren couldn't care less. 
We sing Yaakov Mimos, Ibi Vimos, we have a, in Haggadah, Estel, Pan de la Frision, we have some things. But by and large, even those people who are interested now in the younger generation in Ladino, it's a curiosity. They're not gonna speak it as their mother tongue anymore. It's dead as a mother tongue. We have to face that fact. And 50 years from now, who's gonna care less about speaking Ladino as our mother tongue? There's no, con there's no context for it anymore. So forget it, enjoy it, draw, draw whatever we can from it. And there's much beauty in it, but that's not gonna be our future. Our future isn't gonna be in language. I think ultimately, let's say uh, uh, Mashiach should come, we'll all be speaking Hebrew. It'll be a more common language uh, for the Jewish people. Uh, but it won't be Ladino, I could guarantee that. Uh, one question here just from a, 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 a rabbi you mentioned in the, in the uh, program. Can you rename that rabbi, the Laverno rabbi you mentioned? Eliyahu Ben Amozeg, B-E-N-A-M-O-Z-E-G-H. Ben Amozeg. If you go to our website, jewishideas.org, we have a couple of articles about him. You can learn all about him. He was quite an extraordinary man. So some people criticize this position about uh, universalism, and they actually look to Israel as the key example um, where certain identities dominate despite a 50-50 split and more and more mixed. How do you address those inequalities and those inequities in Israel, particularly within Jewish philosophy and Jewish traditions? Well, fortunately, there are many very smart Sephardim in Israel that are working on this issue. I mean, people feel, if they feel impinged upon or feel oppressed, they have, a, they have wherewithal to, to voice their opinion. It's been very difficult, but they're, they're, they have, they've had success. Um, there are Sephardic politicians, there are Sephardic intellectuals, there are Sephardic professors. You know, it takes, it takes a while uh, to get entirely integrated, so to speak. But the answer isn't where we are now. The answer is, what are the trends? The trends are, if you look at the marriage trends, higher and higher number, 25, 30% of Israelis that get married, they don't get married to someone from their own same ethnic group, maybe even be higher by now. They get married to a Moroccan, they get married to an Iranian, they get married to a Bukharian, they get married to a German Jew, and the mix is gonna happen. Let me give an example in our family. I have, our son is married to a nice Ashkenazic wife. They're older their kids, they're Sephardic Ashkenazic. The answer is they're both. They, they brought, they draw on both traditions. My other, one of our, our oldest, or older daughter is married to a Syrian Jew, and he's Syrian. He's very, very strong in Syrian. And my daughter is a very strong Spanish and Portuguese and, and uh, Ladino Jew, she's very strong. And their kids are a mixture. They went to Ashkenazic schools, and, but they could do it. I call my kids, my grandchildren ambidextrous. They can read Ashkenazic, they can read Sephardic. They're comfortable in both worlds. And our other daughter is married to a good German Jew, uh, Yeki. And they're very, very religious Yeki. They're very, very strict to their tradition. And you know what? I love it. It's wonderful. Because they, they know who they are also. They're very, very strong in what they are. Our grandchildren, they're gonna draw from, from all these different traditions. And you know what? That makes me happy. That makes me happy. And I think my great, great, great grandchildren, they're gonna have 10 more ethnicities to draw from and they'll be even stronger than we are now. I think um, one criticism I'm still seeing in the chat is that um, the importance and the universalism, I understand, but one of the criticism seems popping up is that what happens then when, again, the majority becomes the default and the minority kind of just kind of assimilates into the majority as the default Jewish narrative. So my, so that, that can be a challenge. It's a challenge, but the minority should not default. It's, if, if we fail, it's not because Ashkenazim are, are oppressing us. If we fail because we don't have a, a gumption to stand up for ourselves. You know, I, 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 over the course of my life, I have plenty of compl complaints about the education I received in Ashkenazim schools. I have plenty of complaints. But I can't say, with very few exceptions, that the Ashkenazic teachers didn't, they were hated Sephardim. They didn't. They didn't know any better. They taught what they knew. On Chanukah, we eat latkes. They didn't know anything else. Our job is to bring more mullahs to school on Chanukah, so they'll see that there's, a, there's something else to eat. When they quote this from this rabbi, Rav Kook, we should say, yes, there was Rav Kook. There's also Rav Uziel. It's our job to, to bring the things to the, to the fore. One of our great flaws at Sephardim is we don't even know who the heck we are ourselves. Sephardim are amazingly ignorant of their own traditions and history. Amazing. And that's part of our problem. If we would know more and study more and, and take our stuff more seriously, we would be able to communicate ourselves with greater strength. And when we fight for Sephardism, 
We're fighting for Sephardism, not for Sephardic music or, oh, well, that's fine, not for Sephardic food, which is fine. We're, fight, we're fighting for the Sephardic brain. We have things to teach the whole Jewish world. And if we don't teach them, no one's gonna teach them. Okay. I think that's good for tonight. I think so as well. I wanna thank you, Rabbi, so much. If you have any questions, please email me at info at jewishideas.org. I always answer all emails. So feel free to, enter, uh, to contact me. Info at jewishideas.org. Rabbi Angel, thank you so much for the wonderful part three of our four part series. Next week will be our final part um, of the four part series, same time, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. So make sure to join back at the same link and the topic will be Rabbi. The topic will be rationalism and mysticism, religion and superstition. <laughs> Big topic. Cannot wait. <laughs> Better ways. <Excellent. laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I wish you all a good evening. Take care. Thank you so much, everybody. They all ask, they, they, they text him and then he relays them to me. <laughs>